Hi everyone, welcome. It's Thursday again. You know that because you're online and you're watching this for the next hour. So uh, welcome to those of you that have been here lots of times before. Um, welcome to those of you that haven't. Um, so if you haven't been here and you don't know why you're here, why did you click on a link that you found? But if you do have an idea of why you're here, it's probably to look at that piece of software. So Capture One um, is a raw processing piece of software written by the guys called Capture One out in uh, Copenhagen in Denmark and it's the software that allows us to take our raw data from our cameras so the raw images that were recorded onto your memory cards do some fun and games uh, with them hopefully improve them which is what most of today is going to be about and then spit them out the other side as fully fledged pictures ready to print or display or whatever you want to do with them so we're going to spend the next hour going through capture one um, editing the pictures that you've sent in. There's also a couple of other things we're going to cover as well. Um, just for fun, we're going to cover watermarks today. Um, and there's a couple of gotchas in there that even got me because I haven't used them for quite a while. So we're going to cover that today in the next hour. Um, please make this as interactive as you want. So you've got a live chat box somewhere there, I think, or if you've popped it out, it's somewhere there. Either way. Um, so if you're live watching, like people like Jim, who've made it back into the fold, see you try and run away and then you have to come back. Uh, so if you are live online, please um, ask questions, ask away. Uh, if I do something that doesn't make sense, then ask why I've done it. Or if I do something that does make sense, but you've got a better idea, then let us know. Um, this is as much about you sharing your stuff as it is me telling you what I would do, which is what most of this session's about. So... Um, with that said, uh, let's, I guess, get started. First thing, current version. Uh, the current version of Capture One is released version 22, which is software version, yeah, okay, uh, 15. So version 15 is Capture One 22, 22 being the version that was released in 2022. Well, that was actually released in 21. Uh, anyway. So if you go to your about screen in Capture One or Capture One about or help about, depending on whether you're on um, Mac or Windows, you're going to see a more detailed version number. And the one you're looking for, if you want to follow along with everything today, is 15.3.2. So Capture One 22 is the marketing version. The actual software build is 15.3.2. If you have a previous version... Nine times out of ten, you're going to be able to follow along. Uh, it's just that there may be some tools in here that work a little different, look a little different. Certainly, the interface will look a little different now. Um, but most of the stuff you'll be able to carry across, depending on how far back you go. So if you're on version 21, which was 14, or 20, which was 13, you get the idea. There was a bit of a gap in between. Um then you're probably fine. If you're on version sort of 9, 10, 11, you're going to be quite a way out of date. So Capture One has different ways of licensing. One of them is the monthly subscription, which means you've got the ability to always have access to the latest version. Um, I'm not going to say for free because it's not for free. You've paid for it. That's what your monthly subscription's for. Um, but if you're worried about always being on the latest one, then the subscription can work. If you want to, I love this quote, own your software, you don't own it. You actually read the end user license agreement. You don't own it. However, you do have the perpetual right, hence it's called perpetual licensing, to use that piece of software as long as you like. The problem comes with that in that if an operating system update happens or you change hardware or, or all manner of different things, you may find yourself forced onto a later version anyway, as some people are finding out now with like old Mojave systems and stuff in Mac. So you work out what licensing works for you, but right now, as of today, if you're not on 15.3.2, you're not on the latest version. If you are, then great. Um, we can have some fun and <laughs> try and follow along. So a couple questions before we get um, going. I actually asked about Capture One Live. I'll cover that in a second as to why. Um, Tony, I've been here before, but I still don't know why I'm here. Uh, we can talk about this later. <laughs> um, so Martin's online. Yay. Hi, Martin. Um, and lots of people that are in sunny places. Right. If I start melting in this session, it's because my office is today, having left it alone for a little while, 3,244 degrees. Um, so sorry about that. Uh, oh, anyone else having problem with the healing tool not working properly after the latest update? I'm not, 
Doesn't mean others aren't. Um, only removes about 50% of it. It sounds like you've got an opacity thing. It might be that your brush is linked. We'll have a look in a second. We'll go in and, and check the things that you can check to make sure it's uh, nothing, nothing weird. Okay. So, as I say, put your comments in. We'll try and catch them as we go. If I miss one, sorry. Um, we'll try and get as many as we can. So before we get going into the actual Capture One application, a couple of things, um, almost housekeeping stuff. So masterclasses, you will see in the description for this session, quite a few people have asked, how do I view previous masterclasses? So if you have not been on one of the masterclasses, they're one and a half hour specific topic sessions that we're running. Um, they are paid sessions, but they are, I would say, very, very, very economical. However, um, for those of you that want access to the back catalog, as it were, go to um, our website. So poorreefer.com slash, or if you go into, I think, workshops or ex expeditions, I think it is, and then live online. Um, there's a link in this video down below here that will take you there, and that will give you the link to all of the previous masterclasses. So you can access those. Um, they can be purchased after the event. Obviously, you won't get the live element of it, but you will be able to watch it as many times as you like. For those of you wanting to go on the next one, the next one's not for a while. It's 25th of October, which is seven and a half weeks. So you're going to miss me. Oh. Um, but in seven and a half weeks time, we will do one on capturing and editing, most importantly, the night sky. So we're going to go all the way through from the right way of capturing based on your camera, whether it's ISO invariant, whether it's ISO variant, and, all, and actually what does that mean? Um, and all the stuff around star trails versus trackers and whatever, through to how we actually get the very best out of any image that the camera is stored of the stars, the Aurora, the Milky Way. Um, whatever okay um where are we next next up catch you on live said I'd, I'd talk about it um so Capture One Live was launched, and in fact, you'll see there the little preview thumbnail. Um, we, David and I, did a session. Um, it's called David and Paul in a Hotel Room. Uh, but David and I at Capture One did a uh, Capture One Live session when Capture One Live was launched in terms of how it can be used commercially. So linking um, your client or a uh, editor, art director, whatever, um, or a Marcoms uh, manager, and all of that um, process and how that can be made useful within Capture One Live and how Capture One Live can facilitate that workflow. That was quite a while ago. Um, and in the meantime, obviously, you know, millions of sessions have been done. So the guys have got a lot of data about how Live is being used. Um, I've used it on a couple of um, actually quite random occasions, which I didn't think so. I, I didn't think I'd use it for, but they have been useful. But the most important thing is between now, in fact, between about a week ago and the 21st of September, they're offering free usage of Capture One Live. So you don't need a subscription. Normally it needed a subscription every month. Um, so for the next few hours or few days, sorry, few days, God, three weeks, there you go, next three weeks, you have access to Capture One Live. You can create live albums from your collections uh, within your catalog or from a session and so on. And you're able to share that link with or without passwords and all the other stuff for a, per or a period of time that you choose. So for those of you that weren't sure about it or want to have a play with it, now is the time to see if you're going to use it. Because it said originally it was unlimited. It's limited to a thousand sessions. Um, if you're shooting, what does that work out in the next three weeks? Um, sort of what, 35 odd um, sessions a day? If you're shooting that many clients a day, then well done. Get off of here. Get back to making money. You're making a fortune. Um, but if you're not, a thousand is plenty. Um, so it's basically designed to allow you to be able to give it a try, um, put it as part of the workflow, see if it works and whatever, but have a play with Capture One Live while you can, while it's free, um, and see there. So there you go. Make use of that. Um, final one. Final, final, final one. I promise, UK people mentioned this on Facebook. In fact, for those of you that are not on it, um, 
keep an eye out on the Facebook group that we have because there's lots of stuff going on in there where you'll get preview stuff or preview um, links and so on to things that we then catch up in these sessions um, every month. So you'll get advanced stuff to, for instance, Walter's really cool frame um, script that he's put up there. So you can all download it from there, but you need to go in there to find it. And in there, you will find, for those people in the UK, sorry, in the UK only, um, the guys at Teamwork, who are one of um, Capture One's partners, um, are doing a freebie giveaway. Um, Nairevo bags, which are the ones that I use. Uh, so basically, you need to show them as trashed as your bag has become. And the most worthy person, as judged by them, based on how trashed that bag is, will win about, it's, it's almost 600 euros worth of bag. Um, kind of cool. But uh, you've got to put some work in. You've got to prove that your bag is desperately in need of replacement. Doesn't mean trash your bag, because you might not win. Don't do that. That would be silly. But if you have a bag that you use all the time, which is in desperate need of replacement, I would go with uh, I would go with trying to enter that competition. You might win. You might you might get one. Cool. Right. Let's go into capture one. And as I do that, I'm just going to cover Steve's question. Why can't I get instant availability of the masterclass session when I pay for it? Um, because the process that happens after the masterclass is semi-manual is the answer so if you need instant access to the masterclass then it needs to be done beforehand because um, you'll have access to it live and immediately afterwards if you um, join on to it afterwards yes there is a delay um, in getting um, some of those links out um, but two hours to wait for a session yeah, okay um, if that's if that's gonna kill people sorry um, but that's what it's probably gonna be and that's not a service level agreement I'm committing to there Right, um, where are we? I'm going to leave David to cover this one because apparently Paul has had nervous behaviour since 15.3. Um, so, David, you can um, ask ask Paula to quantify what nervous means. Um, but flickering screen and blackout, to be honest, that sounds like a graphics card um, conflict or issue or something like that, Paula. So... Um, let us know what machine you're on, what hardware you're on. Um, it's possibly not. Um, it's possibly a, maybe a conflict or something within Capture One across the graphics driver or something. I don't know if any other preferences have changed, but um, flag um, what hardware you're on. Um, but David's picked you up there. So, yeah, you might need to do a bit of a, um, a reset of some of the, the files within your system, um, which might flush it out. If you're on uh, an M1 system, then let the guys know, because that should all be ironed out by now. Right, we are in Capture One, this being the Capture One interface. All cool. Uh, Capture One interface obviously is customizable. We talk about that quite a lot, but please, please make sure you are customizing your workspace to how you want to work. Those of you that are missing the neat icons like these, it's probably because you've got them still set to icons and text, and they're now very, very big. And those of you that don't like that, then you might want to just click on the little three dots and say icons only and compact. If you upgraded from 15 point something to the latest version, you might find that your workspace is reset. Sometimes it happens. If it does, really simple. On your um, window uh, menu, you've got all of the workspaces you ever had because they're backed up before you do any update. So you can reset your workspace back to what you had before. But bear in mind, it won't necessarily include any new tools that are included. So for instance, if you've customized your toolbar and they then launch live up here or the cloud transfer for iPad, when you reset your workspace back to a previous version that you're always familiar with, just bear in mind that those new icons that the new workspace comes with will not appear. You're going to have to add them manually. How to add them manually? Well, you obviously did it before, um, but customize toolbar and you can drag things up and down i'm going to leave that there in a second uh well in fact we'll put it up because uh there's a little preview into a little a little challenge that some of you are going to face um there with that icon so here we go a general um shot this is shot out in uh, nevada a few weeks back um so no real big edits on there. there's a bit of dynamic range recovery on there we could let's say put a i'm gonna put an elevation style on there so apply that to a new layer because i don't want it to go over the top and i'm going to back that away to maybe 50 percent so 
Now we've warmed it up. We made it look a bit more sort of golden hour-y. But there's our, our shot of a what's apparently a ghost town-ish. Um, but we've got all this cool detail in here. Love this. Um, anyway, the reason for showing you this is because I want to watermark it. And a lot of people are confused with how the watermark tool works. Um, a lot of people are getting caught out with it not displaying, including, ironically, um, me earlier, because I had a bit of a meltdown when I got back in. Um, but basically, there is a function within Capture One when you export your files to include a watermark over the top. And many people don't use it. I'm not going to go in massively into the should you or shouldn't you use a watermark um, discussion. Frankly, that's your call. There are probably two reasons for using a watermark on an image. Well, maybe three. The first is to stop people that are supposed to have the image from doing bad things with it. So what I mean by that, if you're a wedding photographer and you've sent a load of raw files out and they're not ready, you're not you're not ready for, for them to be out, outside, or <coughs> sorry, excuse me, or you're a commercial photographer and you've you know you sent the raws to an art director to check through and you don't want them being um, uh, broadcast, let's, let's call it that, until you've had your chance to make the final edits then you might want to watermark your images um, across them with a you know sample or preview or whatever um, just to stop that from happening. Number two, stopping people that you do not want to have your image from having it. In other words, there's a watermark across it so that people can't pretend it's their own. And I get that some people do it that way. The third reason, and it's funnily enough, one of the reasons that we um, watermark stuff certainly online is because it enables people to find out who took the image. And this is down to how, let's call it, how obnoxious that watermark is going to be. I'm not a fan of big watermarks across the middle or big signatures across the, the top of it and whatever else. We have our standard one, which is our, our normal logo stuff that sits down in the bottom corner. Um, but there are many other different reasons for using watermarks and many reasons for not. Personally, I wish watermarks didn't need to exist because... I want people to look at the picture, not at a logo. Um, but we're in a world where, unfortunately, sometimes there are reasons that they need to. So I've got my picture, I've got my edits. And by the way, one of the um, advantages you've got of Capture One Live is that for all those raw scenarios where you want someone to be able to go through an album and share and, and rate and give you feedback, you can use Capture One Live to do that rather than publishing a load of um, files with or without watermarks and then giving someone an album that you've had to build or code or put into another system. You can just share your Capture One album using live. So maybe have a look at that. But let's assume we want to send out um, this picture with a watermark, or we're producing it for web and we want to put a watermark on it. So one of the things that a lot of people don't realize, in your um, export area down here, um, you've actually got a load of stuff which is hidden. Um, well, it's by default, it's uh, is actually collapsed up. So you've got a summary and all that sort of stuff, but um, it's actually collapsed up down there. And if you were to go to the export dialog box, so remember, I've added my export tab. So I've gone on to here, add a tool tab and told it I want to have export on this um, section here. That means that I can do exporting in the background. I get this queue thing happen, which is doing stuff in the background, but I can go back to my other tabs and do other things while it's doing that. If I'm doing the export through the dialog box, this one here, what you'll find, <coughs> pardon me, is the default dialog box here does not have a watermark option. And the reason is because you haven't ticked this little box down here saying show all options. The tab version of export has all options. The dialog box, this one, the, the sort of happy wizard, as it were, does not have all options enabled by default. You've got a ticket, and then all of a sudden you get this extra little section down here, along with other different sections. So bear that in mind that not every um, option is displayed at the point that you're in this dialog box if you haven't enabled show all options. But whether you're in the dialog box or not, if you've got it enabled or you're in the, the tab, you'll find a recipe option in here called export watermark. And it's different for every single recipe. 
and that's important in a second. So if I create a TIFF file here, at the moment I have no watermark on it. If I create this recipe called playing, then I have this watermark on it. So I've got an image as a watermark. Great. So let's in fact go on to our TIFF one. So I'm going to add a new watermark. We're going to say I want an image. And I can either click on this little three dots here, which will go to the file system, or I can drag a file in. Cool, that's the black version of our watermark. If I don't like that one, I've got the white version. Bear in mind you want your watermark to be a PNG file, ideally with a transparent background. So that's PNG 24. If you're using a whatever, um, Affinity or Photoshop or whatever, make sure there's no background to the file, export it, effectively export for web, um, but export it as a PNG 24, because that means you can include transparency. Otherwise, well, actually, if your watermark is a, is a square or a rectangle, no issue. But if you don't have transparency um, in your watermark itself, you're not going to be able to see uh, anything behind it. It's just going to give you a rectangular blob. So here's all my settings. So I might want to make it completely opaque. Might want to make it a bit bigger, a bit smaller. Uh, let's talk about the size and the scale and where it is, the horizontal and vertical. But there's one problem. I can't see it. I don't know if you can't, but I can't see my watermark on the picture. Which is odd, because I'm in this recipe. Let me enable it. Yeah, so I've enabled the recipe. Huh. Can't see it there. In fact, even my playing one, I can't see the watermark on there. So, you know, let's put this back to the middle and middle. Hmm. No watermark on there. Scale's a bit small. Let's make it huge. Oh, no. Still not there. Why? And this comes down to, in fairness, a change. In, in the, the Sorry, the confusion with this comes down to a change that was made in the way that recipe proofing works because of the export dialog box change. So remember in Capture One, we are always proofing. We're always using the color profile. But... Unless you actually enable recipe proofing under your view menu, or if you've added that little thing, there was a hint earlier, and turn it on, now all of, us, all of a sudden we've got our watermark displayed. So in other words, the recipe, and we've covered this in previous lives about, you know, if you're doing a black and white ICC or a, a color one, and why isn't it changing? The reason is you don't have proofing enabled. Now proofing goes all the way through all of your viewers. So your viewer here, which is the bit when you press the G button on your keyboard, your viewer is either proofing or not. If it is not proofing, then you're not seeing the impact of your recipes. So on your export here, if, for example, I change, uh, let's go on to here and say, my ICC profile is going to be a, well, let's go black and white. In fact, that's not going to help me. <laughs> uh, let's go instead into a grey G18, something like that. Right. So I've got my grey image, right, because I'm proofing the recipe that I have selected. If I go to my other recipe, it goes back to colour, because that's an sRGB. Go back to the TIFF, it's proofing the ICC. If I turn my proofing off, no dice. I'm not going to see any difference between all of these recipes. So please, please be careful that if you are planning on seeing the output, you need to make sure you've got proofing on and maybe add that icon up onto your toolbar. If not the icon, view recipe proofing. And under the proof profile that you're currently viewing, so that, that's basically recipe proofing. Let's just turn that off. You've also got the ability under proof, pro, sorry, proof profile to choose a specific proof profile that you're viewing without recipe proofing on. So this is where it gets a bit confusing. So with recipe proofing, you're seeing the output recipe, which will include watermarks and all the other stuff. If you use proof profile, which a lot of people do, then it's going to fix you to whatever ICC profile was used according to the recipe that you've chosen down here. The best, from my perspective, maybe um, different to others, but the best thing you can do is leave this on selected recipe. Because what that means is my proof profile, not proofing, is going to be dynamic based on which recipe I've got set in the back end of my export tab. But if I turn on proofing, that's also going to give me all of the other things that happen as part of this export. So I've added my watermark. 
I've made sure I've got proofing on and I'm now going to change our opacity down a little bit. I'm going to change the scale for sure. We're going to make that nice and small. We're going to move it horizontally or vertically. So bear in mind these are positive or negative values. You can see it changing here. So it's basically a 50% move, well, 55 to allow it to go beyond, or 55 the other way to allow it to go beyond. If I go to 50, you'll see it's right at the edge. So the reason it allows you to go to 55 is so that the middle of that watermark can get to the middle or to the, the edge um, over here. So that's fine. In fact, we'll just bring it in a little bit with a margin. Great. Vertically, I want it to go down. So negative values, not quite down there. And there's our watermark. Might want it a bit more opaque. Okay, cool. Two things to bear in mind. Number one, your recipe's watermarks are linked to the recipe. So there's no global watermark in that sense. You're setting it based on the recipe. So bear that in mind when you start going between multiple different recipes. And the reason, because one recipe might have a different sizing option to the other, okay? Um, one recipe might be to export at 3,000 pixels wide. One might be to export at 10,000 pixels wide. Therefore, your watermark may change in size and scale. The second thing to bear in mind is that your sensor size, so this is a 151 megapixel sensor. This has a lot of pixels. Therefore, the scale of this watermark is dependent. Remember that scale here is a arbitrary number to a certain extent. That scale is based on this image. So 64 in scale. If I set 64 in scale on this one, I get the same scale of my image. If I change this here to 2000 pixels wide, remember it changes the scale because I've got two recipes now, which have the same scale. In fact, let's make it literally the same. 64 scale, 64 scale, but this 64 scale is against an image which is 15, 16,000 pixels wide. This 64 scale is against an image which is only 2,000 pixels wide. So that scale changes. And the reason this is important is because if I go back to another image, which was taken on a different camera with a different sensor size, my recipe profile or my export profile with a watermark, if I'm exporting at the full size, in other words, the scale of this image changes or the, the long edge or the width changes from one camera to the next at full size, which it will, then my watermark scale is going to change as well. If I'm always using these exported at 2000 pixels, let's say, then it really doesn't matter what sensor I'm using, what camera I'm using, because it's always going to be the same in relation to this scale here on the export format and size. So as long as it doesn't matter what sensor I'm using, if I'm always exporting to the same recipe and that recipe has a fixed scale involved. If the recipe has a 100% scale, in other words, the whole sensor's worth, then depending on your sensor size, the pixels are going to be different in terms of number. And the more pixels, the bigger the picture, that's the smaller that scale is going to appear for your watermark. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, so let's just catch on a couple of questions um, because that was a bit of a whoosh um, view into it. Um, JD, I only use watermarks with image names so that when the client is culling, they can easily select. Yep. Uh, yeah, some people will do that. So if you put the overlay of the image name across it rather than just the file name. So some people prefer that rather than using the file name as a reference, actually put the file name across the, the, the front of the image. Um, Prasad, yes, you get a gold star. Proofing needs to be enabled. Um, where are we? Uh, JD wants his uh, tether session. Uh, Paula, can you use vector images SVG? I don't believe you can. I think Mario's just covered it, but um, no, I think you are stuck with a bitmap based image, even though it's not, you know, it's not a BMP file, but um, you know, JPEG, um, PNG, the normal, the, the the normal suspects, as it were. Um, Prasad, having 
Uh, yes, having scale in both absolute and relative values along with the percentage is another option would resolve this situation, probably. Yes, it would. Um, funnily enough, I had a, a quick message backwards and forwards with David about the scale issue because... It, the, so here's the mitigation on the scale thing, and this is actually David quite right in this this um, position, which is typically when you're watermarking an image, it's not the full image. It's very rare that you would send a full res image watermarked out to a customer, client, friend, family, whatever. It's normally that you're scaling down, right? So it's a web size image, let's call it that. As a result of using a web size image, you're typically not going to leave this as fixed scale at 100%. In other words, the sensor size. You're typically going to set it to a long edge, um, regardless of what I see. Let me turn off the ICC profile because otherwise we're going to confuse people. Um, but typically we'd say, you know, it's going to have always a width of, not in pixels, but a width of 2048 or something like that. Therefore, this watermark becomes then fixed because every single image that I put through that export recipe, which ignore the name for now, because obviously we wouldn't leave it as that name, but it doesn't matter now what sensor size I use um, in, in the original file, because it's always going to come out at 2048 pixels wide. Therefore, this watermark is always going to be that big in that corner. It's never going to move. Um, so it doesn't matter the input then because the output is stable. The issue is when this output is not stable. So when the scale is set at fixed 100%, then your input image is determining how big the output is and the watermark is not relative. And that's the, that's the challenge with it. Okay. So I hope that's watermarks. Um, but genuinely, for those of you that want to use it but are a little scared to, so because we've had a couple questions in saying... You know, what was it? Someone asked, "Can we do a script in um, in Photoshop to to put a watermark in?" Because people are always exporting to Photoshop to do their um, web size images. You don't need to. Um, just build a recipe for your web size images. Import your watermark of choice, whatever that is. A, a signature. Of a, remember as well, it doesn't have to be image. You can actually use text in there. Um, so you can also use tokens. So to JD's point just now, um, if I'm searching for, let's say, image name. So we drag that on there. So image name, pull R. And then we could even put um, a counter. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do a, maybe a three-digit counter as well for whatever fun and games. Um, now, for some reason, where have we... There it is at the top. Let's just move that down here. Um, so I can put tokens in, just like I could with... Um, your export name, so your file name. Remember, you can put tokens up here, so it doesn't have to be just image name. It can be image name dash my name dash date dash variant number, whatever tokens you want to use. But you can also use that in the watermark itself. So what JD was talking about is it can sometimes be easier for someone if they're selecting through images if the name of the file is actually over the top of it. And, of course, you've got the standard one of these and of course you can change your your text and whatever else but you know well don not steal yeah if your name's don don't steal um but yeah we can put that across there we can make it slightly opaque we can do whatever we want with it um but that's based on text and if you don't like these um movement sliders here by the way just click on the little hand and you can just move this into position and you'll see it's moving the sliders for you kind of handy but if you've got an image, you've got a logo, you've got a whatever signature, that's how to do it. Um, but hopefully that sort of covers it. For anyone that's got any questions on it, there are little helps and tool tips and stuff like that. But again, put them in the comments later on. We'll try and cover stuff. But Watermarks really is easy in Capture One, and it's a one-click option. You, you literally have exported um, your, your JPEG or your whatever, your TIFF file. You can export it with a Watermark or without, or yours. Um, ah, David, there you go. Uh, so it covers JPEG, PNG, TIFF. Um, but yeah, as I said earlier, the PNG is really useful because you can um, you can remove um, your your background out of it. Brandon, interesting thought. Actually, it would be very handy to have a text and image. People are never happy, but I agree. Um, text and image wouldn't be a bad idea. So you can have you know logo and then file name or whatever. Really cool. Um, 
Can you rotate a watermark in text? No, I don't believe so, unless um, David's going to disagree, but I'm pretty sure it's fixed as as straight and, and, and level. But obviously, if you've got a graphic watermark, then yes, you can you can put it however else you like. Um, right, uh, ooh, where are we? Uh, does the watermark have to be a PSD or can it be JPEG? No, it can be a, a JPEG, it can be a, a PNG. Um, you can export it out of Capture One if you want. Um, so you could make a watermark, but then Capture One's really not designed for doing that. I would suggest you probably want to use a pixel editor to create a watermark or stick with text. Okay, let's pick on a different image. So yeah, that was a quick edit there because I just applied a style <laughs> to it. So that was easy. Um, right, Wilfred's. I'm going to turn off proofing only because it's going to make life very complicated if I uh, if I start doing weird things. So Wilfred's shot here. Um, very cool lightning shot. Um, bit of a, you know, we're at 30 seconds, so it's a bit of a long exposure. Typically, the, the way that lightning shots can be achieved very easily, um, well, not easily, you have to be in the right place, there's, there's number one. Um, but you can get away almost with things by um, using a long exposure, in this case, 30 seconds. So you set your camera up for the right exposure, slightly underexposed, actually, for 30 seconds and then hope that lightning arrives within that 30 seconds. And if you're in a lightning storm, you can pretty much predict that it's going to come every whatever, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, um, and so on. So you leave the shutter open. Um, hopefully, at some point during your exposure, along comes a bolt of lightning, and off you go. Um, interestingly, for those of you that are on um, Phase 1 cameras, not a good use of frame averaging. Because if that lightning bolt happens for one two thousandth of your exposure you're going to have it covered as one two thousandth of this brightness in that in that middle but for a traditional long exposure obviously it's additive the exposure the second that lightning hits um, the center it's going to stay blown for the whole time and then you get hopefully a very cool shot like this one so this is um, wilfred's um, example export um, and the question was, how do we deal with this sort of bright blue here? How do we basically amp up um, this shot without making it overly um, saturated, overly, um, I guess, almost painted uh, from the original? And the original being here. So this is the uh, the actual source file. And this was the edit um, that Wilfred sent in. And I get what you mean, Wilfred. The you know the sky is a little bit too blue, maybe a bit too um, a bit too cyan. Um, I'd almost argue that these are a little distracting in here because, funnily enough, it's the first thing I see. So if I sort of look away and look back, do I do I first see the lightning bolt? Actually, no. Um, I, I sort of see this big mass of of plants and stuff in the foreground. So maybe we want to work on that too. But let's just have a little uh, look into, um, have I got, huh, that's an interesting one, given Mr. Grover's online. I'm not going to log this as support call, but if I forgot to turn that off, which is the watermark movement tool, which happens to sit up here with my hand tool. So if I come out of the export tab um, and go into another tool, it leaves me with the watermark moving tool, um, even though I'm not in an area where I can do watermark moving. So yeah, a bit weird. Anyway, back to my normal hand tool, which is the pan tool. So to move around here, what is that? Oh, it's just a bit of a plan. I thought that was a twister or something. Anyway. Um, so here is our raw image. We're going to do some some standard steps, I guess, to begin with. Um, so do we need a diffraction correction at 1.8? Probably not. Um, but again, with all these tools, I'd be tempted just to turn it on, turn it off, see if it gets better or worse. With diffraction correction, if it doesn't get better, don't enable it. So don't just leave it on for the sake of it. If it improves the sharpness, especially at the edges of the shot, turn it on. If it does not improve them, then turn it off because we don't know what else it's affecting uh, within the rest of the um, within the rest of the image. Now on here, we have a bit of a sharpness problem. Um, not going to lie. So if I look at the JPEG here, quite a lot of this has been um, enhanced in terms of structure to try and make it sharper than it really is. 
this here isn't quite sharp and it's whether there's a bit of movement i think it's possible you know knowing this stuff is pro possibly wind um but even the the sort of flat areas out here maybe that's sharp there i think maybe there was a little focus challenge you're probably focused out here i'm just going to go to my um, adjustments tab and pull up the exposure to see what we can see so the good thing with this is a sony where are we at 6500 actually mm, cool it's done very well in um in low light um at iso 200 um, we can still pull it up uh, we're not getting huge amounts of noise or anything and it looks like the focus point is here in the original which is too close which means the stuff that's out to infinity is slightly off and look you can see here on these flowers here so Ideally, this would have had a slightly more distant focus. Um, it can be difficult at night, I know. Um, and it's, what One thing to bear in mind, and I was covering this a couple of weeks ago with, with some people I was with. Um, it's funny, the, the default, we'll cover this actually on the Capture in the Night Sky um, masterclass stuff. The detail um, on, on objects, you've got a challenge at night because people forget there's almost an, an, an automatic, right, I'm at night, so I'm going to go to my widest aperture, right. If I shot this scene at 1.8 in the day, I'd have a very shallow depth of field. Just because the sun has turned itself off for the night doesn't mean that my depth of field changes. If I shoot at 1.8 at night, I still get the same depth of field. I'm not increasing it just because it's night, and there's a, there's a risk here. So a lot of people, when they shoot stars, will shoot at the widest aperture and set to infinity. That's great unless you've got a foreground because the foreground's going to be out. Or if I set to focus on the foreground, then my stars are going to be out and all the other stuff. So we need to learn about, funnily enough, he's just, Brian's odd, he's just mentioned it. We need to learn things like hyperfocal distance. But we've also got to think about what's the best aperture, not the widest aperture, what's the best aperture for this scene. And also bear in mind what the sensor can do because if you've got a very, very, very good sensor, you can get away with a more forgiving at or aperture. And in this case here, we either needed to be focused a little bit further out to keep that sharpness, or use maybe a slightly um, smaller aperture um, all the way. Right. Um, so we've had a look as to why it might be slightly out. That's fine. Let's just pull back our exposure. So back to where we started from. But what we also know as a result of that little change is we've got a pretty much noise free set of shadows here, which is really good. So we have got a lightning bolt here, which, as I say, is slightly out. And in the edited version, it's still slightly out. It's just been um, tweaked with structure and, and clarity. So first thing i'm going to do is pull up our shadows the temptation in this shot would be to pull up black why because most of this dark stuff here this bit and this bit and so on sits in the darkest parts of the histogram over here on the very far or very very far left if i want to pull up the darkest parts of the image then the temptation as i say would be pull up black because that's going to leave the mid-tones alone. It's going to pull up all of the darkest parts and push them into the shadows. The problem with pushing stuff into the shadows is that I lose all contrast. Because if you imagine that histogram in a, in a very high contrast scenario, you'd have real peaks at the top and real peaks at the bottom, and you get almost a, an inverse bell curve. That's what gives us contrast, the distance effectively between the brightest parts and the darkest parts of the image. The second I start, well, start squashing them into the middle, everything becomes a mid-tone. And when everything becomes a mid-tone, I have no contrast. So in this case here, pulling up the black, it really does help lift up that tree and the foreground here. But you can see it starts to go flat. And that's it's kind of the effect that we've got in this edit here. And I think for me, it still needs some of that sort of nighttime feel to it. So yes, we can pull up black a little bit just to take the clip off of the very, very left hand side of that histogram. But I'm talking about 10 maximum. The rest I'm going to pull up with shadow. And the reason that I'm using shadow instead is because shadow is going to pull up this whole lump here. So everything that's in the bottom quarter, bottom third of the histogram and squash it up towards the middle, but together. So it's not squashing the black into the shadows, it's pulling the black and the shadows all the way up. So 
I would be in a place where you're lifting shadows a little bit is going to help us. But also, as we saw, we can lift the whole image up, the highlights. Now, what are we trying to protect in the highlights? Because normally in a landscape picture, we don't want to push the highlights too far, right? But if we push the highlights too far, then they go overexposed. Our only highlight in this picture is that lightning streak, which is already overexposed. There is no other highlight here. Maybe there's some specular lights over here, but again, they're already overexposed. So I've got no risk. Look at this histogram here. Look at all this space here. So yes, I can pull up shadow. Yes, I can pull up black, but actually I can pull them up less and instead use exposure, which gives me a more natural lift of all of the tones because all the tones come up together. If this is now too bright, well, I can use the highlight recovery just to pull those bits down a little bit, but I've lifted the entire series of, of data or the entire row of data all the way up to be brighter and more vibrant. And actually, as a result, you end up with more contrast. So if I just do a before and after here to here, this feels a much more natural lifting of this tree than here. Now, um, we're worried about the sky. And actually, if we want to really draw um, the viewer into this, this piece of lightning, so I'm going to add a new layer. Uh, we're going to call it sky. And I'm going to draw a very, very, very soft graduated filter up here. So in order to see the filter, I'm going to press M on my keyboard. So that allows me to see it. And we've also now, as the latest version, has got the filter. Oh, sorry, got the um, mask, not filter. Software filter, there we go, if you want to call it that, but the mask, um, the visibility is going to show and toggle whether I've got it on or off up on the top. I want to, I want this to fall off asymmetrically. So in other words, softly for the first 50% and then very quickly for the last bit. So I'm going to hold down the Option key or the Alt key on the keyboard here, and that allows me to move these lines independently. What that's doing is allowing me to do that. Now... Have done that. Let's just pull down our exposure a touch just on this sky bit here. I'm going to crank up quite a bit of clarity to get a load of cloud formation. Now, here's the problem that's also applied to the tree. So, the tree that I've just spent time making lighter, I've now darkened again. So, how do we fix that? Easy, Luma range. Display the mask. I want everything that was bright, but I want you to exclude the tree. Nice soft fall off so you don't notice where the mask finishes. A bit of a radius around it. Hit apply. And I've now excluded the tree from my mask. So just uh, pull up the grayscale version. So you can now see what that mask is actually doing because of the luma range. So it's covering the whole sky, tapers off towards the lightning, and then the tree and some of these other shadows here are excluded. Perfect. The lightning itself. Let's call this one lightning. Let's create a, I was going to go magic brush, but I don't need to. Um, so my standard brush, really soft. Um, I think, it, who was it was asking? Was it Brian? Someone was asking about their eraser only under 50%. One thing just to check is that you don't have your eraser with brush link enabled because maybe it, you might be thinking that you're using 100% on the eraser, but actually it's taking the value from the brush, potentially. Um, but yeah, depending on whether you prefer it or not, I would link or unlink that. So just a really rough um, ser or series of, of brush strokes over that. Up here, I'm actually going to sort of taper this in a little bit. Ooh, I hit the exposure thing by accident. Now, what I'm also going to do is go to refine mask, but I'm going to show you what that's going to do. So there's my standard mask. If I go to refine mask and pull this to about there, I get a lot more detail. Capture One's going to basically work out what should be and shouldn't be included in that mask based on the areas around the mask. I get a lovely, cool mask that's set around the areas that I want. So that's right click, refine mask, and change the value. If you want to see what it's doing, Make sure you've got your thing here set to display grayscale mask. With this area here, I am going to pull down those highlights to really bolden that up. I am going to push up some clarity. I am going to push up some structure. And we're also going to use that saturation slider to keep that glow going in. Uh, we've got a couple of questions. Let me just check. Uh, where are we? 
JD, focus at infinity during the daytime and tape your lens in that position. That works if you need infinity, but if later on you don't need infinity, that's not going to help you. So yes, but just only in, in the situation where it's it's the right um, point. Um, or if Flyers Nation is a storm chaser, I would advise to crank up the F-stop. Yeah, 1.89 is very risky because of the focused issue. Um, so yeah, just just don't always automatically go to the widest of your lens think about what you're trying to um trying to capture um tempted to try a black and white conversion maybe all a bit in here i think um the, the color was what i think wilford was trying for um michael does anyone else wish that hdr controls were in the order of white highlight shadow black i do yes the issue is it used to be the hdr tool was originally highlights and shadows right then they added white and black, and that's why they've ended up um, later on. But yes, in in theory, it would make a bit of sense if they were in the order of, of the right way. But yeah, the only thing I would say is, and actually Jim's sort of picked up on it, but white and black are very powerful, but really only have very, very niche uses. So typically I'd like to prefer, I'd prefer to see people using highlights and shadow recovery rather than extreme white and black recovery. And maybe it's a way of sort of tempting people to try highlights and shadows first because they're more forgiving. Right. Um, so other bits on this image. Let's talk about the sharpness. So, oops, sorry. I just drawn a mask over there. So let's just talk about um, this out here. Can I do much with the sharpness of this image? Not really. Um, there are a few tricks that we can try. So we can add a bit of structure on. That's going to help. Not a massive amount. But it does kind of help um, sharpen things up a little bit. If I go into our details tab, I can go onto our sharpening, and I'm going to set the sharpening amount to be a bit higher than normal. But I'm going to pull the radius down. So in other words, the distance it can go from an edge to add that sharpness in, because I don't want to see any halos around those edges. So I'm, I'm restricting what Capture One can do around the edges of contrast. I'm also going to reduce the threshold so it doesn't exclude much. In other words, I know everything in this image pretty much is not quite sharp. So there's no point in setting a threshold to only go for the big items that are on desperate need of it. I'm going to set the threshold low to make sure that that sharpening happens to almost everything on the shot. Then I can pull this up. Not this much, not too much. You start to see all this, uh, hopefully you can see on the, the video, but all this grain and grit appear and also all these white areas around the leaves. Yes, you can use halo suppression to fix those white areas a bit. So look, with halo suppression on, it's fixed most of those halos, but it's actually gone a bit blurry. Halo suppression off, you've got all the halos back, but at least it's sharp. So maybe we put a little bit of halo suppression in, probably to about there. And we're going to back away that sharpening to about maybe there. So some pretty extreme sharpening we're using, but we're having to because it's just not quite in, unfortunately. Um, there is a bit of keystone work to do on this. Um, I haven't tried this yet on this one, but let's give it a go, auto, no. So we've got a bit of a lean on here on the tree. I'm not sure whether it's a, a rotate or a keystone, but at 14 mil, it's probably distortion a little bit there. Um, if I hit our distortion button, it's gonna try and do some stuff, but it's not enough. So instead, I'm gonna use our keystone tool and just oops, sorry wrong way pull this so that we've got a little bit more vertical in there i can change our aspect so i can squish or i can stretch the shot here and there's a little bit of rotation actually i just want to see if we can get this a bit straighter feeling like that there cool now with my crop well maybe that allows us to go in a little bit tighter just to keep more of this foreground in place and we get to there and then with our background maybe overall in the background we might want to pull up saturation a touch if that blue up there is doing what you know wilfred's concerned about um then easy color editor go to our blues in this case it is blue not cyan i'm just using the basic one we can pull down the saturation a touch not too much don't make it gray um, but you know a couple points down there and we can pull down the lightness to get back into that sort of night sky along there again equally we could pick on these greens so if you really wanted the greens to pop well we can pull up their lightness a touch 
pull up their saturation but i would keep these muted i wouldn't keep i wouldn't allow them to go that strong so that they they're they're that um vivid because it's going to take away some of the uh some of the focus in terms of the overall color out here onto that lightning you know we already increased the saturation a touch if you wanted a bit more out there it's not the end of the world um but i wouldn't push it too far so i lost the ability to spell saturation there for a second um let's just invert that mask really really soft over along here into there i'm also going to go into my luma range just like before and exclude the dark parts of the tree this is really handy so in other words out of that histogram get all of this stuff slowly lose it down to here and then none of this stuff hit apply and with that i can turn my mask off and we can pull up saturation you know not too much don't do that but you know you can you can push this quite away because there is a faint color in there but um you know it's enough to play with um just don't push it too far and that's sort of it so i wouldn't go to there it just seems too strong in color in in i guess vividness or whatever you want to call it or vibrance um and we've got this distraction down here i would go to there um and certainly if i do before and after when we go from there across to there we're in a much better place um but the sharpness issue there's not really much we can do massively with it um there um uh, yeah so chili i wish we could extend the amount that you can keystone with the aspect part so do i the squashing and the squeezing it, it needs to go another probably 100 percent the other way um but yes um for anamorphic stuff as you say it's uh it's not going to help you unfortunately um it's not designed to do that but it's not going to help massively um Stuart, do we have time to quickly go into here possibly so this was a rainbow shot um, and about how we get the best out of this shot. I'm not sure what the subject is, obviously farmland, but I'm not sure what this is, whether it's a cattle thing or something, but clearly this, the subject is about this rainbow. Um, the crops that you've sent me are these, which then start to lose concert or context. I would actually go somewhere in between, because to be honest, this edit is okay. Um, I don't, th you know, they're, they're minor tweaks that have actually done a good job. So it's a levels increase. It's, it's funny to go from there to there. It feels like it's a big change, but it's not. There's a levels increase. There's a shadow reduction. So actually make the shadows darker, um, boosting up saturation, boosting up contrast, taking down brightness and taking down exposure. They're all global adjustments that have been done on this shot. The issue that I have is it's just about composition because this here doesn't help me. And if I want to push the viewer out to there, then I need to do that. So I would be in a place of using a, whether it's a one by two or a two by three doesn't really matter, but I'd just be into sort of this space here. Um, and again, I'm not sure how relevant um, that building or, or framework is, but let me just uh, reset that and clone it so we can compare. Um, but yeah, so if I go back to my 2x3 setup and come into sort of there, that to me, focus A, the first thing you see is, is there. B, you get a second bit there. If you really want to enhance this part over here, you're going to need a separate layer, separate little paintbrush. Just paint over there. I've got a very low opacity brush, but we could up that. And then with that area there, we're just going to up the contrast. And we're going to then bring up brightness so we get that difference, again, between the rainbow and the mountain. So you go from there to there. If it's affected other bits that we didn't want included, well, we're just going to use... We, well, in fact, let's give it a go. Let's use our um, magic eraser. See what it does. Uh, very low tolerance... Let's see if it can just remove the grass. Yeah, it's going to do a decent job by the look of it. Remove the cloud as well. Oh, nope, it's getting the rainbow. Too much tolerance. Pull that tolerance down to one. Nope, still gets the rainbow. So it may be, and this is one thing as well, people have now got magic brush. They've stopped being able to use normal eraser. Magic eraser, magic brush are great, but so are brush and eraser. So you can still use your brush and your eraser, and it will still do a good job. Um, you don't need to use magic brush for everything. 
But if you really wanted that left-hand side to pop as well, that's how I'd do it. A boost in contrast, but then a boost in brightness because it all sits in the shadow. You want to lift it all up. And that's that's literally it. So I'm not sure about the subject. It's not my um, ideal target subject. I'm not sure what it is. Um, but, you know, if you want to focus the viewer on the rainbow, I'd lose a lot of this foreground here. Um, and I'd go into that place there. Potentially even old school, go a little bit vignette -y, but just bear in mind that's going to clip that rainbow on the left-hand side as well. But the rest of the edits that you've got on there, um, they're perfectly fine. Um, there's no issue with that. Um, just, you know, if you wanted to lift this side here, it does need its own layer, separate layer like you've seen me just do. And all you need to do is adjust those two there. If you really want it to pop, you can use a touch of clarity on top of it, but that can actually erode from the um, from the rainbow if you're not too careful. So just keep an eye on how much clarity you use. Most of the rainbow improvement is done through contrast and brightness to lift it up as a result. Okay, that's it for today. We covered quite a lot. It doesn't feel like we have because we've only looked at three images, but we've covered watermarks from start to finish. Proofing, recipe profiles, all that we've sort of covered by by default. Please do um, go in and use, you know, the your Capture One Live. Where are we? That one. Um, so if you don't know how to use it or the, the use cases for it, have a look at the Capture One Live video. The link is in the description for this one. It will take you to um, Capture One's YouTube um, of it. But you've gone until the 21st of September to play around with it. Why not? If you live in England or Scotland or Wales, but not, I don't think, oh, I'm going to say this wrong, I'm sure. I don't think Northern Ireland because they've listed mainland UK. I, I don't know. Speak to the guys at Teamwork. Um, so Teamwork Photo, they've got that that bag thing um, that you can go, but you've got to send them a picture of your ridiculously trash bag first. Those of you that want to learn Night Sky stuff, we will cover that on the 25th of October. For everyone else, um, send in your images for us to edit. So poorreferlive.wetransfer.com. Please include your name um, when you send it in. If you don't include your name, we cannot put your picture in there. Um, but send in uh, the image, what you're trying to achieve out of it, and we'll um, we'll cover as many as we can. Um, today, obviously, we took up a bit of time with the, the watermarking thing, but we've had a few questions about it, so I wanted to cover that specifically um, as well. Between now and the next uh, session, which will be in about a month, I think, um, the very beginning of October, um, look after yourselves. If you need to get in touch, those are the ways of doing it. Um, but between then and now, um, look after yourselves, and we'll catch you next time. Cheers. Bye-bye.